God could have chosen anywhere on earth, but he chose Israel. He could have revealed his redemption anywhere. He chose Jerusalem. The house of the Lord might have been any place on earth. He chose Mount Moriah. Past, present, and future, the mountain of the Lord has been a beacon of hope and remains a strategic site for the next temple of God. Dateline Jerusalem, the coming temple. We are so glad you've joined us today. We are here on our set, and we also have Dr. Jeffrey Seif in Israel teaching throughout this whole series. And you guys mm -hmm. are new to these chairs, yeah. and you have big shoes to fill, but you are more than ready and more than able. So well, we're you. so glad that you're here with us. We are very glad to be here. You know, every time we've started one of these episodes, we, we see different titles, and they seem to go to some place completely different. I know you all love it when you see the title Worship. Oh, what is worship? today's modern worship is a little bit so different, different than the worship we're going to be talking about <laughs> back <laughs> then, because back then's worship is more like a barbecue, yes. uh, at yeah. least involving a sacrifice or so. So today we get to talk about how they used to worship mm. back then. All right, it's going to be good. Right now we take you to Dr. Seif's teaching in Jerusalem. Have you ever heard it said that people just don't take time to smell the roses? Well, in this case, it's smelling the rosemary and coming from a field of it here in Jerusalem. Uh, it's a sweet smell in my nose. I mention this by way of introduction to underscore that in biblical literature over and again, readers are informed that sacrifices are a sweet aroma in God's nostrils. Now, of course, God doesn't have nostrils per se, it's an anthropomorphic ascription, that is to say, it's using a characteristic to describe. But sacrifice is so very part and parcel. Uh, when you look at Adam and Cheva, Adam and Eve in Eden, there was sin and, and an animal was slaughtered and they wore those skins. There was a death to enable them to carry on with life and you find that thematically. What's just done in Genesis is institutionalized in Exodus with the manufacture of this worship space. Beginning in chapter 25 of Shemot of Exodus, guess what? They're bringing resources to build the tabernacle. Why? So that I might dwell among them. And then they go with that tabernacle into the future. Now with the construction of this worship space that we find all throughout biblical literature, and we find it emerging in modernity here in Israel, which really was the genesis for this series. Because today people don't speak of sacrifice and worship. I mean, making a sacrifice is a tithe or an offering, but we don't think of a sacrificial system per se, replete with priests and animals and sacrifices and et cetera. Now, high church traditions have a bit more of that, you know, with the incense and, and clergy that wear priestly paraphernalia and are referred to as priests. But in large measure, in American evangelicalism anyway, there's much less of that. You know, and the minister is a preacher, not a priest. So the whole concept of sacrifice and priesthood and sanctuary kind of falls into disuse, save the fact Bible readers stumble into it. Now, what I want to do is look at the instruction manual on the quick, um, where I'm looking here at Leviticus. Now, the word Leviticus comes from a Latin word meaning pertaining to the Levites. And if you look at the, the writing of Leviticus, uh, it's contemporaneous with the writings of Exodus when they're there at the base of the mountain and they're, they're building the Mishkan, this, this portable worship facility. But once you build worship space, you need individuals that know what to do in it. Thus, the calling forth of Levites. In fact, Leviticus in, in English, as we know it, comes from the Latin pertaining to the Levites. Actually, in Hebrew, the book is called Vayikra, which comes from a word, and he called. It comes from the opening statement, uh, Vayikra el Moshe, and the Lord uh, called to Moses. And I'm really just interested in a statement in the next verse where he says, Mikem Karban. 
uh, he speaks of bringing an offering. Jesus speaks of korban uh, in the Newer Testament. He goes on to say here in, in verse two, when those who bring an offering, uh, the whole concept of bringing an offering to a priest for a sacrifice, uh, again, as I'd said, isn't uh, part of the experience uh, of Christianity today or Judaism for that matter. Judaism is like a lecture house in synagogues. Now, now some synagogues refer to themselves as temples, but those are reform synagogues. Those aren't traditional observant Jewish synagogues because they, they would never call, you'd call it a synagogue, uh, but never a temple because there's only one temple and that's the temple in Jerusalem. And they want that temple to be rebuilt and they want these sacrifices the bringing of the offering to the temples to be reconstituted. There's one temple. If you look at biblical literature, uh, the, the whole notion of central worship is so very central, though in so many ways it is so very lost today. It's our job here to bring it to life and, and show you the value of it for Christians today. When you look in Leviticus and elsewhere in the Bible, there's lots of instructions about it. We're interested in one particular chapter, I'm not gonna to get to it now, where there's instructions for an animal that's necessary for the purposes of dedicating sacred space uh, for purposes of things divine. A red heifer. You're gonna learn about that and more as we look at good news through the eyes of the Jews. We open up the Bible and learn about yesterday. And in this program, in this series, we learn about what's happening here in Jerusalem today in our series called Dateline Jerusalem. Dr. Seif will continue his talk about the mysterious red heifer in an upcoming program. But right now we'll hear from Yitzhak Mamo, who was influential in bringing five red heifers to Israel in preparation for the purification procedures necessary for the next temple. Our cameras documented the selection as well as the inspection of the heifers in Texas. And now that they've been taken to Israel, we'll continue to keep you informed. Here's Yitzhak Mamo. Welcome to Israel. Welcome to Mount of Olive. Uh, Mount of Olive actually is separated to two. One part is the cemetery, the big Jewish cemetery in the world, I think. When you are in the old city, you can see the cemetery. And other part of the mountain is what we call the Mount of Olive because of the, all of the olives that grow here. And we are actually in the center of the Mount of Olive at the front of the Temple Mountain. We're looking for a place that we can make the ceremony of the red heifer. And the red heifer had to be done at the front of the temple. So we know that the temple was standing, the Holy of the Holy stand, where today is the Dam of the Rock. Okay, actually the Dam of the Rock mentioned as the rock. In the Holy of the Holy, there was a rock. On this rock was standing the Ark. And it's said to be a place that you can see the temple. It means something between the tree that we can see here to the tree that we, it's some, somewhere here. So this is the place that we think we can make the ceremony of, Mount, of, the, of the red heifer. We build a, a visitor center but to let people see the red heifer, but at the same time, it will be a research center because we believe that even if God will not let us to do it next year, maybe it will take 10 years, maybe it will take 20 years, but we have little experience that we can give to the next generation to find a way to find the red heifer. We know that in uh, the book of Numbers, we got the order to make the red heifer. Uh, more than the age of the three years that nobody walked with her and that she without blemish. And actually we know that the, the Bible said that we had to make kind of a ceremony to burn this red heifer together with Aesop and other things. And the ashes with, was mixed with water, spring water. And when we throw it on people, they began to be pure. 
Why? We don't know. And I think that sometimes believers have to say, I don't know. Sometimes believers say, have to say, I don't understand. I think, I mean, this is maybe a <laughs> kind of test for, our, for us as a believer. I know you felt his energy and passion about this subject, but I also feel like you guys have that same passion about, well, you were there. I was there at the selection process. Yes. In fact, I was following this story when I watched Sola back as a teenager. I would do current events on this in, in a history class, talking about the red heifer. Everybody says, what's a red heifer? I'm like, numbers 19. It gives the qualifications for this red heifer. And they haven't found one in like 2,000 years. So I was so excited when we got the call that we were going to Rockwall, Texas. And I was like, Lord, this is amazing. Thank you very much. He, yes. He's so excited. Yeah. He is. He's ready. Yes. His people are just like, hallelujah, it's coming soon. Yeah. And you guys aren't that hallelujah-ish <laughs> about it, are you? <laughs> they're they're exactly. excited because the red heifer is needed to fulfill prophecy. Yeah. They're going to take this red heifer. They are going to incinerate it. They're going to take its ashes. They're yeah. going to mix it with yeah. the Gihon Springs, Gihon Springs, Springs water. 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 Yeah. And, and this whole process is needed for them to be able to uh, bring in the third temple. Yes. And it's, it's, it's messing up the status quo because one group of the Jews is like, yes, we want this. We yeah. want to bring back. And the other one's like, no, we want business as usual. And they're acting like the Pharisees and the Sadducees yeah. of old fighting. But, but we personally don't support it because we want more time yeah. to minister to the Jewish people that Yeshua has already come. And so some Christians are supporting this effort thinking, we're making prophecy happen faster. You cannot speed up or slow down prophecy. It's going to mm. come in God's timing. But witness to the lost. Why don't you do that? Put your dollars toward ministries that are supporting the lost. That's what I think we should do. Yeah, that's good. Love your enthusiasm. Right now, we take you back to Dr. Seif's teaching in Jerusalem. During the first century, there was a walkway that led from the Pool of Siloam to the Holy House of the Lord on the Temple Mount. Millions of devout pilgrims would have taken a 700-yard climb during the three holy days of the Jewish year, Pesach, Shavuot, and Sukkot. Following the Roman destruction in 70 AD, the walkway was completely covered by debris and dirt for nearly 2,000 years. Now, after 10 years of intense digging, the pilgrimage road has been uncovered and leads to the Earth's epicenter, the Temple Mount. In the restoration process, a one-of-a-kind gold bell was found. Researchers believe it may have accidentally broken loose from the tunic of the high priest as he made his way up to the temple. Dr. Seif continues now from an underground tunnel adjacent to the pilgrimage road. I'm proximate to so much, it's, it's hard to know where to start. <laughs> Probably the best place to start is at a place where I can get some sure footing because it's wet, the stones are slippery, the path is precarious. As you might well imagine, this isn't a frequented tourist area, but we take you to places where visitors don't always go. Now, in close proximity to this spot is the Pool of Siloam. You might recall that Jesus, in the ninth chapter of the Gospel of John, sent someone there to wash, and the blind man got a miracle. Proximate to that is a pathway that goes up to the temple complex in Jesus' day, and you might recall, and I'm gonna visit the story in a moment, where uh, there were individuals that were buying and selling and trading, and this invoked it, Jesus' ire, um, because space that was dedicated for religious purposes uh, had turned into uh, a, a place for profit and enterprise. You know, and I'm all for profit and enterprise, but if you've heard the old expression, there's, there's a time and place for everything. In the, uh, the second chapter of the Gospel of John, uh, worship had deteriorated. God had, had, had built a holy house, a Beit HaMikodesh, Mikdash, Mikodesh, holy, Kodesh, and, and, and it was defiled, and, and Jesus was chagrined. We're told that he finds merchants selling sheep and oxen and other kinds of things, paraphernalia, money changers and the like, and again, adjacent to me in another corridor, proximate to this space, you can see uh, replications of that leading all the way up to the city, right up to the temple complex itself. It, chagrined as he was by the commercialism 
associated with sacred space. Now think of this, the temple is, is a refabricated Eden. Um, it, it, it's it, the interior of it with palm, with, uh, uh, with, with menorah, which, you know, the, the menorahs are like it's Chaim, trees of life. If you look at the cheruvim, the guardian angel figures uh, that were carved into it, 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 uh, it the Jerusalem temple uh, is kind of a, a bit of heaven on earth. And to think that it was corrupted. Jesus said, get these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. Uh, God's house isn't a place for transacting business, save for forgiveness itself. And people made their way to Jerusalem only to be exploited. That indeed is problematic. And speaking of making our way to Jerusalem, here I am, as I mentioned at the very outset, proximate to the Pool of Siloam. That's down the hill further. There's a lot of work being done there to, to, to continue to dig around it, to expand the archaeological find. So much is happening here in Israel, and I'm pleased to bring you some information associated with it in this program, Dateline Jerusalem. On our last program, we visited a full-size replica of the tabernacle to better understand the layout and attributes of the temple. We were given insights regarding the altar of sacrifice and the copper wash basin in the outer courtyard. Ariel Sims continues his description now about the priest's duties within the tabernacle, the holy place. So uh, every day the priest would go in either to uh, keep the menorah lit, every day to, to keep the lamp lit, uh, or to burn more incense um, on the altar of incense, or once a week on Shabbat, they would eat the showbread on the north side of the tabernacle, the bread that sat all week long on the table until Shabbat where they, when they would eat it. The menorah was made of pure gold and made of one solid piece of gold, meaning they didn't take different pieces and attach them and weld them, but they took one big chunk of gold and they shaped it and molded it and, and hammered it into this into that beautiful piece of artwork. And uh, it didn't burn with a candle like we would think of today. Rather, it burned with olive oil and a little piece of string that came at the front. Every day they would have to go in and fill more, more oil, uh, cut the wicks, uh, replace the wick every, every once in a while. And it was the only source of light in the entire room. So you can try to imagine if all the walls were covered in gold inside, then all of that light would have reflected off the walls and light up the whole room. The table of showbread on the north side of the uh, tabernacle, opposite from the lampstand, the menorah, um, on the table were 12 loaves of bread, symbolizing God's provision for the 12 tribes of Israel, also symbolizing the 12 months of the year. So it symbolizes how God provides for all of his people and all the time, all year long. When they ate the bread, they ate it with olive oil and with a little, a little plant called hyssop. Hyssop uh, in Hebrew, Ezov, is a plant that is used to make a modern Israeli spice called za'atar. If you've tried it, it's, it's good stuff. Um, but the plant hyssop itself uh, occurs uh, or is, sh shows up quite a bit throughout the Old Testament as a plant that represents purity. Uh, I would say the most famous example is Psalm 51, when David says, Purify me, O Lord, with hyssop. The altar of incense, uh, also called the inner altar, where they would every day had to had to burn incense, where they didn't they didn't sacrifice animals like they did here outside, but but every day the priests had to offer incense. They would take different plants and herbs and flour, grind it into a into a very fine powder, sprinkle it on the altar, and it would fill the entire room with a beautiful smell, a beautiful aroma. And that smell, that incense, that represents prayer. It represents the prayers of the Israelites ascending to heaven. And it also represents our prayers today as being like a sweet and beautiful smell to the Lord. So the curtain separated between the Holy and Holy of Holies, um, made up of what we call the Holy Colors, which the same colors, same materials and colors that, uh, that was the first layer that covered the tent on the outside. Uh, blue, purple, red, white, and then blue again. We don't know the exact pattern, but we know roughly the shades of the colors and the Hebrew names of these colors uh, or the biblical names of these colors are not just the names of the colors themselves, but also the names of the materials they were made of. And, but inside, 
uh, stitched onto the veil that's separated between the Holy and Holy of Holies with gold stitching were angels called cherubim. Uh, there are different types of angels throughout the Bible. There's cherubim, there's seraphim, there's nephilim, which are bad angels, evil angels. But the, the cherubim are the angels that represent the presence of God. And they are the angels that God has set before him in order to guard his glory. Only the high priest was allowed to go uh, into the Holy of Holies and only once a year. That day is Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the same day that he was to make the atonement sacrifice for the people. So he would, on that day, he was the only person in the entire compound, the high priest. No one could even enter into the courtyard on that day. First, uh, he had to offer a personal sacrifice for himself before he could make a sacrifice for all of Israel. Then he would walk in with the blood of the sacrifice into the Holy of Holies and sprinkle the blood on the Ark of Covenant. And that would atone for the sins of Israel for that year. And when the high priest went into the Holy of Holies, he wasn't dressed all colorful and fancy like he did the rest of the year. He was dressed only in white like a regular priest. He had to come in humble and pure before the Lord. God wanted man to partake in this tabernacle worship because it was a mirror of that which was in heaven. And it foreshadowed redemption by the blood of Yeshua that was to come. Unfortunately, Satan has been working overtime to infiltrate the body of Christ, the church, with a perverse form of worship. It doesn't happen immediately. It's a slight, slow, methodical altering of the truth over time to get man to focus on self which reverts to the worship of Satan and not the worship of God. That's called apostasy, guys, and it is a deliberate act of the enemy. Well, I sat down with Mark Hitchcock to talk to him about this coming great apostasy that's prophesied in the scriptures. Thanks for being with us again, Mark. Yes. I know some people look at the church today as an institution and they think the church is not in very good shape. I know there's a lot of prophetic words that Paul gives about an apostasy, this coming apostasy that's coming to the church. It's kind of there now. What do you, what do you have to say about the prophetic apostasy or the falling away that might hit believers? Mm -hmm. Well, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, it talks about the apostasy. That's yeah. going to be the final great apostasy that I think will happen after the rapture takes place. Mm, it's going to be yeah. a, just a total falling away. Free for all. <laughs> yeah, but when we look at today, you, know, you could say we're, maybe we're kind of on the leading edge of that. Yeah, uh, we're not there yet. But yeah, there are lots of prophecies in the New Testament about apostasy. You know, the, the last book of the New Testament before the book of Revelation is the book of Jude. Mm -hmm. It's a little 25 verse book that's basically about apostasy. It's yeah. about falling away. I often refer to the book of Jude as like the foyer to the book of Revelation. Yeah. It's kind of the, the lead into it. And it kind of is describing what conditions will be like when the end times arrive. That's but right. you know, the Apostle Paul says in, in, uh, in, in 1 Timothy 4 verse 1, he says, the Spirit exp expressly says in the latter days, mm -hmm. many will fall away from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and, and demonic doctrines. Mm -hmm. um, he, says, he says in 2 Timothy, he says, evil men and seducers will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So th this world is headed towards a time of ultimate apostasy when the Antichrist comes, declares he's God. Yeah. But we see a lot of this. And apostasy is both doctrinal and moral. That's true. So there's a doctrinal element. We see you know, people denying the essential truths of the faith, but also all these moral issues that are there are, are turning away as well. So we see all of that really uh, coming and cascading in, in, our, in our world today. And that, I think that's a real sign of the times. It's a sign of, the, of Christ's coming. Yeah, so it gives us hope that good is on the way when, when Messiah comes from us. But in the meantime, we just have to double our efforts and speak the truth. That's right. Yeah, the, uh, someone used to say, the darker the outlook, the brighter the uplook. That's right. And uh, so, yeah, apostasy is a key sign of the times. Thank you, Mark. You're welcome. That's a heavy topic, and it's prophetic that Mark spoke about. And you can learn more about these prophetic topics in Mark's book, The End. We're giving it to you when you give an offering to this ministry. It's our way of saying thank you. And it's also a bookmark that we're giving along with it with uh, scriptures that Josh and I selected that have prophetic meaning that will help you along on your journey. Caleb just said it's a heavy topic. It's also, should I say, a heavy book. <laughs> it's a 500 page hardback book, not a cheap paperback one. It's a, it's a good book that we would love to have you get for a generous donation to this ministry. Thank you in advance for that. Also, may I say 
the footage that you're seeing in this whole series, beautiful footage all over Israel. We would love to take you there to experience that in person. We go both in the fall and the spring. And guys, I think, aren't you going to be going with us soon? We are so excited. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, we are. We're going to be are. teaching yeah. on yes, location. We will. That's right. We're going to be leading worship on location. Yes. It's going to be a great time. pretty much going to be amazing. Join us. Yeah, falafel, all you can eat, <laughs> shawarma, hummus, I could go on forever. Well, speaking of worship, as Jeff talked about and Mark Hitchcock, there was a perversion of worship that was going on back then with apostasy, with altering the truth of, of God. And you read in Revelation 2 of 3, there's some pretty heavy messages that Yeshua himself gives to the seven churches in Asia. They're not very good. Maybe one church out of that, Philadelphia, gets a, a good gold star next to it. But those churches are really around today. You can see that in our institutions of our places of worship. And it's kind of that warning that apostasy is continuing to seep in to the doctrine that we're teaching today, just as it did in yesterday. Jude talked about it, Peter, John, Yeshua, it's still around, it's still a problem. It is a problem. We're, we're living in the time that Paul speaks about in 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. Mm. He goes on and on about all these situations that we're dealing with. People are going to love money. They're going to be proud. They're going to be blasphemers, yes. disobedient to their parents, all these things. And we're dealing with that now. The thing about apostasy that is so wicked is that it's not accidental. Don't pretend like it is. You're choosing to. We're living in a day and age um, with our ability to communicate through the internet and everything else that pride is rampant. Everything has been directed and made about worshiping ourselves. From the type of photos being created called selfies to how we have complete shrines online for everything we do every moment of the day. I'm not trying to attack any of you for your pages, but you are supposed to make your life about God and about the Father and direct your focus and everyone else's to Him. And that's exactly what we desire to do on mm -hmm. this program. Yes. Every week, tell your friends, tune in, Go online, we're on social media. Find us at Our Jewish Roots. More coming up in the weeks ahead, but yes. we have to close for now. Yep, we do. So as we always say, Sha'alu Shalom, Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Join us right now on our social media sites for exclusive content. Visit our website, levitt.com, for tour information, broadcast schedule, free monthly newsletter, and online store. Call us anytime at 1-800-WONDERS and ask about this week's resource. Our Jewish Roots is a presentation of Zola Levitt Ministries. Partner with us. As a 100% viewer-funded ministry, your gifts allow us to bring you our weekly television series, social media outlets, website, and other ministry endeavors. Please remember we depend on tax-deductible donations from viewers like you.